Okay, welcome to another episode of Q&A about history of science and technology. So I'm happy to talk about both things that I've been personally involved in and things I might have studied from the more ancient past. I will say I just posted something uh, about a little uh, thing that um, we're doing to kind of contribute to the development of science, at least, which is launching our Wolfram Institute. And uh, the, we are in an interesting situation. The science that we've been doing that's come from, well, a big tower of ideas and tools, but most recently has kind of blossomed in our physics project, has led to just a remarkable kind of new direction in science that uh, revolves around this idea of multi-computation. I, I kind of identify multi-computation as sort of a fourth big paradigm for thinking about modeling in science. Just to say something about that, it's uh, kind of a, a little bit revolves around a changing view of the notion of time through uh, different levels of uh, different epochs in the modeling process in science. And um, it's kind of back in antiquity, sort of the main issue in modeling things in the world was kind of what are things made of? Uh, you know, are things made of atoms? Are things made of corpuscles? Are things made of whatever? What are things made of? And, and that's kind of a, a type of uh, approach to thinking about things in science. It doesn't really have much reference to time. It's more a structural kind of approach. And, and many fields of science are still very much dominated by kind of a structural approach to thinking about things. Then, you know, move forward in history, 1600s, sort of big uh, thing at that time was this idea of mathematical equations as a way to describe things in nature. We just say the law of gravity is such that there's this force associated with objects that are this distance apart and so on. Mathematical equations as a way to describe the world uh, in, in mathematical equations, kind of time enters as a parameter, just a variable that you can sort of tune to any value, you can turn to any value you want. So then kind of the next big step, I would say, was in the, in the 80s, 1980s, uh, something that I was deeply involved in myself, which is this idea that one can use programs and computation as a way to model things that happen in the world. And sort of a key idea there was you have a rule for specifying how things work. That rule is kind of a computational rule. And to know what's going to happen in a system, you just keep applying that rule. And that generates kind of this, this strand of behavior through time. And the progress of time is something that corresponds to the, the progress of that computation. And one of the big things that I figured out is this concept of computational irreducibility, the idea that to work out what will happen in that computational process, there may be no faster way to do it than to essentially follow each step and, and see what happens. So the new thing is this thing we call multi-computation. And kind of the idea there is that one's dealing not just with an individual computation, but the interactions between a whole entangled collection of computations. That's something that we kind of tipped off to by thinking about quantum mechanics, but it turns out to be a vastly more general phenomenon and something which has the feature that once you know that things are multi-computational, once you know that there are these many possible threads of computations, which branch, which merge and so on, there is a certain inevitable structure when there's underlying computational irreducibility, there's a certain inexorable structure to the things that are produced by this multi-computational process. The other feature is that instead of there being a single thread of time, there are many threads of time. And the only way you can kind of tell what happened in the system is to have some observer who samples the system uh, slicing across the states of many of those threads of time. So what we discovered first is that this is super relevant to physics and it's kind of a core part of, of how physics seems to work. That was uh, that sort of emerged a couple of years ago. Um, then what we realized is that there are lots of other areas where this kind of idea 
uh, lets you make progress. In a sense, in the 1980s, we kind of realized that there were fundamental limitations on science associated with computational irreducibility. And that made it seem like, oh, there were things where it's going to be, the behavior is going to be very complex and you're not going to be able to make sort of global predictions about it. But what has emerged now is that in multi-computation with particular kinds of observers, and sometimes there are observers who are like us in various ways, with particular kinds of observers, it is possible to make kind of global statements. That's where the laws of physics as we know them, things like general relativity and quantum mechanics, that's where those come from, is the ability to make global statements from this kind of multi-computational system. So in any case, that idea kind of now starts to give one the opportunity to, it really lets one open up sort of scientific progress and the creation of global laws for lots of other areas of science. So the one that I just spent many months on is metamathematics and the physicalization of metamathematics. I think we made some very interesting progress there that kind of unsticks something which has been kind of stuck for a hundred years or so about thinking about the foundations of mathematics. But this multi-computational idea applies to lots of other areas. I mean, one that we're just starting to look at is what I call subchemistry, um, looking at kind of the detailed molecular interactions that leads to chemical processes going on, rather than just the amount of chemicals, the sort of detailed choreography of molecules. And that's relevant for thinking about uh, molecular computing. It's also, I suspect, very relevant for understanding fundamental uh, mechanisms in molecular biology, in immunology, in areas like that. And I think this multi-computational approach has applications in economics. It certainly has applications in distributed computing that we're working out uh, just now. It has applications, I think, potentially in linguistics, in evolutionary biology, in neuroscience, um, all sorts of different areas. It's really quite exciting. And it, it feels like it's sort of a moment when we're really going to be able to make dramatic progress in a lot of areas because we have a really new methodology that we get to apply to those areas. And so now the question is, structurally, how do we do this? And you know, I have a small group that um, you know, I foot the bill for um, that uh, is um, working on our basic science. We have a larger group of people that are affiliated with, with our, our group working mostly on physics related um, initiatives to do with our physics project. And the, uh, the challenge now is, well, all these different areas, what are we going to do with them? How do, we, how do we kind of make progress in all these areas? And that progress requires talented people working in these areas. But actually, it requires another thing as well. It requires strategy for how to do the R&D in these areas to really make rapid progress. And one of the things that I'm pretty pleased with is that over the last 35 years, in our company, Wolfram Research, we've really developed a, I would say, I think it's rather impressive, uh, machine for basically innovating and delivering research and development results. And that kind of mechanism is something that, as I say, we put lots of effort into making it as efficient as possible. We built tools both at the level of technology, software, and so on, and tools at the level of management and kind of a cultural structure that allows us to make that kind of rapid progress with a very talented team. Where, and we know kind of that team, sort of we have the, the mechanisms to identify more people for the team. We have our summer schools and we have a large network and so on. And we also have uh, uh, kind of, we've sort of, we cracked the problem 30 years ago of having a geo-distributed operation and, uh, uh, having that energetically make progress. So we've got kind of the machinery to make progress. And we've applied that machinery in the last couple of years to the physics project, now to the mathematics project and so on. The results are, I think, quite spectacular. So now the question is, how do we scale that up and apply it to all these different fields? And the answer is, we've got, we've got the methodology, we've got the ideas, and we've got the sort of organizational capability to do it. How are we actually gonna do it? At a company like ours, ultimately, uh, some companies do it in a, more, in a funkier way, but with our kind of rather uh, direct business model, um, we are just making things that people 
uh, have value to people and the people to whom they have value buy them. And so it's a, it's kind of an ecosystem where we are putting in lots of research and development, lots of innovation to make products that we then support all that all that R and D from from the revenues from those products. Now, truth is, we've probably got a little bit out of hand because we're probably developing things which might be 50 years ahead of the market. And the fact that we're motivated to do that is sort of an internal motivation. It's not something that's directly driven by the market. But the fact that we can do that is a consequence of our success in the market and our ability to generate revenue from the, the things that we do in the market. And uh, as I say, I've, I've just uh, uh, used some of that to do what we've been doing in basic science the last few years. But generally, basic science is you have kind of a choice. You can say, no, I'm going to keep it as something where I'm going to generate value by some kind of direct commercial loop. Of course, as the timescales for that direct commercial loop get long enough, 50 years, 100 years, those are not things that are realistic to, uh, to be part of some sort of uh, uh, you know, commercial investment kind of, kind of strategy that one might have. So, so what's, what's plan B? Well, plan B is do it for the world. Do it as a piece of basic science. Do it in the kind of open science approach that we've been taking of, of posting all our intermediate uh, uh, results and, and live streaming things and all those kinds of things. Do it for the world. But of course, if you do it for the world, somehow the world has to support that activity. And so one needs some, an, an ecosystem that isn't just based on well, we have this thing that comes from revenue that we make from creating tools for a whole variety of things, and then we'll sort of siphon off a piece of that to use for basic science. One needs a more systematic approach to supporting that basic science. And it's always challenging to understand why should basic science happen? It's kind of a paradox. It's something where everybody I think would agree, a lot of people would agree that in the long view of sort of the development of, of uh, uh, civilization and history and so on, that the development of basic science is important. A lot of the things we have today were made possible because of basic science that was done differing amounts of time in the past, whether it was the discovery of DNA, whether it was the invention of calculus. Uh, you know, these things happened in their time and it took times from decades to centuries before that basic science turned into things where you could say, look, it, it helps people's lives on an everyday basis. It's something of commercial importance. It's something of uh, importance for countries or, or whatever else. Um, so it takes a variable amount of time. And there's this kind of model of saying it's sort of a public good. We're, we're doing basic science. We're just gonna put it out there for the world, for the public. Um, and then the question is, how does that why should anybody support that? Because it's sort of benefiting everybody. So why should anybody actually do anything about it? And for me, I'm, I can do a certain amount about it because I have certain resources and I'm, I find the basic science really interesting and that motivates me to, to develop it. But that only goes so far. And in the end, as you scale it up, it has to be something which has a sort of broader base of support. Now, in general, the thing that always makes basic science sort of easy to support is when the, the entity that's supporting it somehow has a monopoly on the channel by which the basic science will get used. And even if it's going to take 50 years for that basic science to be important, if the entity that's supporting it kind of believes it's sort of got a monopoly on, on those kinds of timescales, even perhaps a shorter timescale, even, even a decade or less, um, but it's kind of, it's basic science. You're putting it out there in the world, but only, only some particular entity has sort of the distribution channel to take advantage of that. So in a classic situation in sort of monopoly industries like Bell Labs in its time, um, like IBM in its time, um, and uh, the, where, you know, if there's, a, if there's an advance in basic science that has, is going to benefit telecommunications, well, the company that's sort of running telecommunications for the largest economy, so to speak, is the one that's going to get the lion's share of the advantage. And so it makes perfect sense for that entity to support basic science. Same is true with the US government in a situation where the US economy is, the, is substantially the largest in the world. 
it's something which leads to great econ greater economic progress is something that it makes sense to support as a as a, a as a government kind of thing as a matter of basic science now people support basic science for other reasons governments support it as a way to uh, keep a, a base of of people within their country who know about sort of advanced kinds of things and, and often it has a certain national pride associated with it and so on uh, occasionally for companies it's like it's cool to sort of wave the flag and say our company was involved in discovering some significant piece of basic science it's an interesting question whether our physics project um, you know exactly how that relates to uh, what um, what what uh, our main business of selling computational language tools and so on um, I know that for me, the, the project was made possible by the you know, 40 years of development of those tools. Without those tools, the project would not have been possible. I also know that from that project, I have learned a lot that is going to allow us to produce a new generation of those tools that will have lots of applications. But as a direct matter, I, I don't know how it relates. So in any case, it's a, uh, what, we, what we intend to do with the Wolfram Institute is uh, where sort of how does one support this? How does it work? Um, how do people uh, the, the provide support for it? How do organizations provide support for it? Uh, the, the fundamental thing that they're supporting is people because the fundamental thing we want to do is advance basic science. And we're, uh, the, 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 when it comes to you know, doing big experiments and telescopes and particle accelerators and all those kinds of things, um, that's that's not kind of the, the part of this that, that we're planning to concentrate on. And there seem to be quite a lot of people who are who are very happy to pursue that if only we can do the sort of intermediate basic science to get to the point of saying there's this specific prediction about this particular thing and so on. It's a little bit less direct uh, in the case of something like subchemistry. Uh, that's a place where thanks to uh, our friends at Emerald who've developed this automated biology and chemistry lab, um, it, it looks like it's actually going to be possible for, for the likes of me to directly do uh, kind of biology and chemistry experiments, which allow us to sort of explore that area um, in physical form. Well, in any case, I, I could, I could uh, talk about some um, kind of the, the life and times of basic research institutes. I've known many um, and uh, kind of what it takes to, to make those things uh, vibrant. I think one very big difference between what we're planning and what has traditionally been done is that you know, we have a definite management model and the management model uh, in the end, it's, it's kind of my initiative, so to speak, as uh, my leadership trying to actually move these projects forward. That's what I've been doing for the last 35 years for our company and more than that um, uh, for other kinds of projects that, that I've done. Um, and I think that uh, what we're kind of relying on in this, is this concept of sort of managed basic research. What you see in most cases when people say, well, we're going to start a basic research institute is it's a much more feral kind of situation where it's like, let's get some, some good researchers and sort of put them together and they'll all do interesting things and they'll all go off in different directions and so on. That's kind of not the model that we intend to adopt. The model we intend to adopt is a scaling up in a, in a basic science direction of the kinds of things that we've learned to do at our company, where it's like, we've got a definite strategic direction. We want to figure out how to do subchemistry and how to apply it to molecular computing. Uh, that's the definite direction. And now it's a question of, of going in that direction and delivering basic science in that direction. Now, it's an important sort of footnote to that, that we're making the decision, we're gonna go in that direction and we're not gonna do it for the sake of saying, we're gonna have some you know, commercial delivery at the end of it that is going to be directly a product. We're going to actually do it as basic science for the world, so to speak. Um, and that's the model at, at this point in, in my life. And I think in the, in the evolution of these ideas, that's the stage that is the most productive to be at, rather than saying, let's, let's find this particular thread from which we can derive something of, of direct commercial applicability and, and pursue that and that alone, so to speak. I think it's much uh, much better for the world. And personally, I think it's more interesting right now to pursue this broader sort of pure basic science kind of approach. So that's kind of what we're, what we're planning to do. 
Now, there are some interesting sort of side comments to make about um, uh, one of my little personal challenges is to see to what extent one can use kind of uh, uh, the, the tokenization of everything and to what extent one can think through, is there a way to kind of develop basic research, the value of basic research in a way that can be described, defined by uh, some, some form of, of token um, it's sort of the exercises. If, if one knew that calculus was going to generate trillions of dollars of value, and one knew that in 1687, what is a way to kind of make use of all that future value? And, you know, we might not be certain, but there will be an expectation of, of, of future value. What is a way to make use of that back in the late 1600s, so to speak, to be able to develop the field more quickly rather than waiting for 100 years for something to happen? You know, is there a way to make use of the sort of dynamics of, of markets and so on to accelerate that kind of thing? And, I, and I'm, I'm a little bit of the way towards figuring that out. And maybe I'll talk about that another time or talk about that if people are interested in that. Um, so Aaron asks, what skills would an incoming fellow for our Wolfram Institute have? And what would be effective preparation? I think... What we're going to be, so first of all, knowing the software tools, things like Wolfram Language and so on, that's a, that's a critical thing because that's kind of, that's the tooling that's going to allow us to, to sort of be, uh, be able to do things at a rapid rate in, in what, we're, what, what we're creating with Wolfram Institute. I mean, again, that's sort of a, a I wouldn't call it an unfair advantage that we have. Uh, it's, you know, we built this giant tower of tooling and by the way, anybody in the world can get access to it. So it's not like it's, it's secret knowledge, but it is something where since we've been involved in building it um, it's, uh, and, and architecting it, um, there seems to be a, a certain concentration of knowledge about that in people around, um, uh, around us. I think the summer school is, is sort of the, a very good on-ramp for the Institute and Institute fellows. And I think we'll probably our first round of fellows uh, will, will uh, many of them may come from that source. Um, for a bunch of the projects that we are now embarking on, we definitely need people who have particular expertise, particular expertise in molecular biology, particular expertise in economics, particular expertise in neuroscience, evolutionary biology, et cetera. And I think the, the kind of the intersection of that particular expertise with knowledge of tools, that's a really good start. I think that's probably more important than, well, for, for those areas, that's more important. For those areas that are, that are fairly uh, just getting started, um, that's more important than specific knowledge of, for example, our physics project. Now, one part of what we'll be doing is more work on the physics project. And I would say that more work on sort of the formal structure of the physics project and the mathematical physics around it, more work on kind of connecting the physics project to experimentally measurable things in that second case, it's, it's absolutely knowing about actual physics and practical kinds of things, um, understanding things which can be related to actual physical experiments and so on. Now, we also intend to have kind of a, um, uh, an on-ramping mechanism. We have the summer school, we have our high school summer camp, we have our, now our middle school camp. These provide a kind of pipeline for people learning both the, the tools the ideas and the methodology that, that we've developed. Um, and uh, it's certainly my hope that we can scale up that kind of, um, uh, that kind of outreach and that kind of um, uh, channel and pipeline for people who have the right kind of expertise to, I think, contribute energetically to the directions that we're going. And, you know, it's, it's really an interesting thing because there's this sort of, there's this tremendous set of, of science opportunities that exist. And we have a methodology and tooling for exploring them. And we have a flow of people interested in being involved. So now we just have to put that together. And in a sense, you know, I've, I've spent a large part of my life, uh, uh, you know, I, I have run a lot of things in my life. So in addition to, I, I like doing things myself, but I also like running things and using the things that I run as sort of machines to amplify the kinds of things that it's possible to, to do. You know, back in 1986, I started a research institute center for studying the sort of emerging field of complexity. 
that I kind of uh, worked to develop in the in the early to mid 1980s. Um, that was uh, an operation uh, at University of Illinois and uh, called Center for Complex Systems Research. And I think it was in some ways successful and in some ways not successful, at least in my definition of success. It was successful in the sense that we brought in a lot of very capable people um, and uh, had, had a good group of people. It was unsuccessful in the sense that I don't think, I mean, many different specific things got done there and many you know, significant papers got written and things like that. Uh, personally, I very rapidly exited the picture because it became clear that sort of managing a thing like that in the context of an organization like the university was not a great optimization of my skills. And uh, so I started our company, Wolfram Research, at that time and uh, kind of uh, have used that as my vehicle for, for the things that I've done ever since. Um, I think that uh, the other thing that... Um, uh, I didn't do was I didn't set the expectation that I was going to in detail lead the kind of R&D effort that we had at our at our research center. Um, instead, it was more like bring in good people and have them do good things rather than this is a project, it's going to be project managed, it's going to have milestones, it's going to be a thing where we've actually got objectives, maybe the objectives change, but it's going to be something where whatever tenacity and intensity I might have in leading things is going to be directly applied to the project. And uh, with Wolfram Institute, I intend that I and, and people working with me will apply sort of tenacity and intensity to projects. And it's not going to be just a uh, more of a bringing good people and let them do what they feel like kind of, kind of thing. It's more bringing good people and have them be part of this flow that we're creating that, um, that leads to something that none of us on our own could do. That is something that is, that is a, 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 um, a project that to which there need to be many contributors, but they have to be pointed in the same direction. If they're kind of pointed in random directions, it is a different, it is much less effective than if they can be, uh, than if there's actual one part of the project is leadership to point things in, in a uniform direction. So, Let's see. Um, Morgan is asking, what is the emerald functionality that's mentioned uh, for biological cellular computational exploration? Actually, it's a company started a decade ago. Um, currently, uh, it's um, uh, based in South San Francisco, although it's about to have a, a big piece that's uh, kind of in the Carnegie Mellon orbit in the Pittsburgh area. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a company whose goal is to automate biology and chemistry lab experiments. And they've so far automated about 200 of those experiments. Um, and I was just looking at um, their HPLC experiments. Um, and uh, it's a little bit scary that, okay, so the whole thing is programmed in Wolfram language, but you know, the, the, the documentation for the HPSC thing is really, really long. And it's got a lot of details about, you know, the buffer reagent and the, the this and the that and the other. It's got lovely pictures of uh, idealized pictures of, of those machines. Those are idealized pictures, but in their actual facility, there are actual machines controlled by some, excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> as I was saying. Um, anyway, in, the, in their actual facility, these are machines controlled by robots and with some people and, and so on in, in the loop. And kind of the idea, the concept is, you write a Wolfram language script which describes an experimental procedure that you want to actually be executed uh, in physical experimentation. And then the results come back to Wolfram Cloud uh, for you to analyze and explore. So I was, uh, I'm hoping that um, we'll be able to explore our kind of subchemistry uh, ideas um, directly by doing physical experiments. Actually, I just had a long piece of mail about that from, uh, from folks there. Um, and uh, 
about um, uh, how to actually start on various pieces of this. I was going to do a, a trial project of taking the fa my favorite uh, brand of chocolate and trying to figure out um, uh, how many wonderful compounds it has in it. as just a, a, a kind of a very, a very quick um, introduction to doing uh, sort of a remote physical lab experiments before we start trying to actually compute the primes of molecules or anything more dramatic like that. Um, but in any case, it's a, I think it's, it's really a, uh, it's something for me, it's a very important uh, piece of tooling for being able to do physical, chemical and biological experiments um, without uh, having uh, spent years learning how to pipette and you know, how to do a Western blot and all those kinds of things. Um, and uh, those are those are things which uh, it's now, and this is typical of the progress of, of science and technology, it's something where we've now got a layer of automation. And so we just have to know what to do, not how to do it, so to speak. Um, let's see, Wobin is asking about overseas and other countries, but I don't know what the context of that is. Um, Uh, okay, so Happy is commenting that wonderful things come out of pursuing science just for the sake of it. Um, and that people often say it's just a fishing trip, it's just some kind of stamp collection effort, but that in fact, when people pursue things they uh, for their own sake, they often produce some um, uh, great, great ideas. I, uh, uh, Happy mentions PCR technology, uh, I certainly knew Carrie Mollis, the inventor of PCR, a bit. I'm not quite sure of the full story of the of the invention of PCR, but I'm not sure it was quite a um, uh, was quite a, a story that that was, I think, a more directed kind of story. But in any case, I, I think it's worth it commenting on on sort of how you get great things out of basic science. First thing is a lot of the story of basic science is knowing what question to ask. And that already frames sort of a context for how to move things forward. That's, that's one thing. Another thing is sometimes there'll be a piece of basic science and you don't have any idea when, you know, at some point in the future, you're going to pick it off the shelf and say, wow, we can do something terrific with that. I mean, an example for me personally, the phenomenon of computational irreducibility that I started working on in the 1980s, um, that uh, I think became sort of a, a stimulus for the idea of proof of work for cryptocurrencies, something I never would have guessed. The concept that sort of the need to do irreducible computational work would turn into, let's use that as a kind of analog of the difficulty of mining gold or something and, and have that be the basis for the sort of store of value in cryptocurrencies. Very bizarre connection, which I wouldn't have made. I'm sure when Alan Turing in 1936 was working on his uh, uh, paper on computable numbers with an application to the decision problem um, that he didn't imagine that a few years later, those concepts will be used to make things like word processors and to do the things that were the sort of, uh, uh, the, that are the practical uses of computers and so on. It's often hard to imagine those things. And I think what basic science contributes is it often provides a new context for thinking about things. It provides the tooling and the raw material you need so that when the world has gotten to a point where you suddenly need that kind of technology, you can sort of wheel it in and make use of it. I think it's an interesting thing, for example, in mathematics, when there is, if you look at sort of the developments of pure mathematics over the course of years, which ones have been later taken off the shelf to actually be used for something? So for example, in, uh, oh, I don't know, differential equations. Okay, they were taken off, they were, they were, as they were created, they were kind of taken off the shelf and used for things. Difference equations, less so. They were created before, long before they were used, I think. Um, something like transfinite numbers uh, developed in the 1880s. Um, it was still not quite at the point where we have a, a pulling it off the shelf and using it kind of, um, a kind of moment, although perhaps for that one, as we think about infinite data structures and things about multi-computation, 
and the uh, and different notions of of getting a result from a computation maybe we finally 140 years later get to take transfinite numbers off the shelf and start using them for something which has technological significance but uh, i think that that um, uh, the thing to say about about the pursuit of basic science it's a surviving pursuit of basic science. There's a certain aesthetic in doing basic science where you're kind of drilling down to the essence of things. And in my experience, when you do that well, the things you do will end up having applications later. But when you are talking about just some very specific corner of this and that and the other, which doesn't have that kind of aesthetic essence to it, well, often that'll be a paper that's rarely read because it's some detail of a detail, and it's not something that has that kind, of, that kind of core foundational essence to it that inevitably leads to applications. I mean, I've been struck by the simple cellular automata that I studied in the 1980s. The, those are sort of the minimal models, the minimal rules of a certain type. And it's been remarkable how many of those things have been applied as models of particular kinds of things, because they are kind of the minimal examples. And so if you're going to start from the minimal example, you're going to hit those things. And those things, as you know about them, will have properties that can be applied in lots of places. So I think sort of basic science that really sort of lives up to the aesthetic of good basic science, of really drilling down to the essence of things, that basic science is sort of necessarily going to be important um, eventually. It's necessarily going to be the foundation of something. We may not yet have the thing, the sort of the, the, the superstructure. We may not yet understand what it is we're going to build on that foundation because our ambient interests and our ambient other technology haven't reached the point where we can see why that's important. But it's sort of inevitable that that foundation will eventually be important. And certainly in my own efforts in studying the computational universe, my big new kind of science book that's just about to be 20 years old now, um, and uh, these things we're doing now with kind of multi-computational physics project, I feel extremely confident. And certainly the evidence I can see from the last 30 something years is that uh, those things which one has really drilled down to the essence, one is going to, are going to end up being important as foundations for lots of things that get done. But you know, I don't think that's a sort of a carte blanche to just say, do basic science for the sake of doing basic science do good basic science and it will be important. And I think basic science has this feature that it is the upstream thing. It is the thing from which many, many things are derived. In my own life and work, one of the reasons that I'm so interested in kind of the tooling and the creation of our computational language is I know that that's kind of an upstream thing that enables a huge number of other things, a huge set of computational Xs, for sort of all values of X, so to speak, of different fields. And it feels like a very high leverage kind of place in which to put one's, one's efforts is something that is sort of a, a tooling or something which is providing for uh, as foundations for lots of kinds of downstream things. And that's the way I feel about good basic science as well. So, um, I, but I think also that uh, and I've seen this many, many times with my own activities, you take a, a field and you maybe say, well, I've got a practical reason why I need to solve some problem in that particular field. And you think, eh, I don't know, that field isn't terribly interesting. There's nothing, you know, it's kind of mundane. It's kind of like, well, I know I can do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get into doing it and you realize, actually, there are foundational questions here, which maybe people in the field have tended to avoid because they figured, you know, oh, those are too hard and we don't really need them for the particular for the particular thing we're aiming for. We don't need to solve those foundational questions. But if you allow yourself the freedom to actually think about those foundational questions, well, gosh, sometimes you can make big progress. And when you do, it builds this huge new tower that can be used in some field or another that you wouldn't ever have got to if you just made that straight, you know, that straight kind of path towards the particular problem you were trying to solve. So I think that's a, that's a feature, again, of good basic science and of the ability to have a little bit of freedom to explore. Because if you say, it's, if it's like, well, we've got to get results in three days, three weeks, three months, three years, whatever. Um, you know, if we've got to say, well, you've got to get to that, you know, take the, take the most direct path. 
to the answer. Just go find the answer. Well, yes, then you will be sort of uh, the, 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 the freedom to do basic science will not be there because you just don't have time. You've got to be rushing towards that answer. Now, it turns out that may be the worst way to try and get towards the answer. You may never get there by trying to make that direct path because actually to get there, you really have to redo the foundations. You really have to understand something which is not directly on that path. I certainly know for our physics project to have gotten to the point that we've gotten to required me to understand and work on a bunch of areas, which if you just said, oh, is that gonna to contribute to fundamental physics? The immediate answer would have been not a chance to understand more about uh, uh, the sort of general computational universe, what programs typically do to understand things like the principle of computational equivalence and computational irreducibility. What does that have to do with the fundamental theory of physics? To understand more, to have the tooling to do things with graph theory and so on that we have in Wolfram language, to have sort of various kinds of experience in how big projects tend to come together, to have sort of certain kinds of almost philosophical knowledge of kind of uh, the, the structure of physics and so on, are things where you might have said, you want to find a fundamental theory of physics, that's not the way to do it. The direct way to do it is, oh, you take, you know, string theory and you add a little extra step on to the end of it and, and that's how you're going to get it. You know, there's a path and you just go incrementally along that path. That's not the way that one's going to be able to do good basic science. And often it's that sort of uh, seemingly random exploration. But I would say that for myself, and certainly this is what we intend to, to pursue at our institute, um, it's do it well and do it foundationally and then it will be something that's important. And don't just do it on the minimal path, so to speak. And I think a general principle that I've noticed is sort of if you are approaching some kind of problem and there's something which is, that's the really hard nut, really difficult part, head for that. Because if you solve it, you've cracked the whole nut open, so to speak. And often that thing is something that surprisingly little has been done on because people have always said, that's the difficult part. You've got to stay away from that. Let's go try and you know, sneak around the side and do the easy parts. And it may turn out the difficult part has been untouched for a hundred years and that there is new, new ideas, new tools, new methods, which then allow you to approach that difficult part um, in a different way that wasn't possible a hundred years ago when that difficult part was last looked at. So that to me has been a very successful approach and I, get we, I guess we get to, to follow that kind of approach in doing the things that we're doing, applying these multi-computation ideas um, and the things we've learned from the physics project to these different areas of science. Um, let's see. Um, Ah, comment from Robin about overseas and other countries, outreach and interaction with education systems. You, you know, the, our summer school and summer camp and so on have had the, uh, and our company actually, has the great good fortune to have people involved from all over the world, uh, from sort of the obvious countries and the not so obvious countries. Um, and to me, that's a source of kind of great strength in the different points of view that it brings in to the kinds of things that we do. Um, and uh, um, it's, um, it's something where on at the level of individual people, I would say that there's sort of a, a very broad geographic mixing. At the level of what governments do and edu official education programs and so on, that's a much more complicated issue and it's much more, you know, there are particular successes of particular things we're doing and particularly somewhat smaller countries um, where it's kind of it's a little easier to kind of turn the ship. Um, and there's sort of interesting things there and we see the results of those. And I think there's in the current time uh, when we look at sort of the emergence of computational X for all X, um, many of those areas are both still very undeveloped and also the, the tools for developing them are tools often ones we've built, for example, that are very widely accessible to people. 
it's not the case that if you're in country, country X, that, oh, we, we can't do that kind of science because we don't have a particle accelerator. Well, that's not true of computational X. You know, so long as you have computers and pretty much everywhere does at this point, you can use the tools that we've built to do computational X for some value of X. And um, so that provides an opportunity for different places to be able to become sort of leaders in those particular areas. And it's sort of a challenge to provide education that will support that. Now, you know, one of the things that's a funny feature of the progress of science, I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently, is the formation of what amount to scientific guilds. You know, there is a particular area of science and maybe it's not so easy to understand. It's, it's got a real stack of intellectual uh, ideas that one has to kind of uh, uh, absorb to get to the point where one is fluent in that area. And what tends to happen is somebody invents it. They have students. The students have students. There are great grand students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually there's this kind of, there's this kind of um, uh, sort of um, uh, this guild that gets produced of people who have direct personal contact, who are apprenticed, who learn about that particular kind of thing. And it's interesting to see, and, and I realized uh, that, well, that tends to build up these fields of science. Now, that can be, that's something which at some level may get unhealthy because it's like, well, everybody knows everybody in that guild and everybody knows what they should do. And so nobody ever does anything that's highly innovative because it's all just doing what the guild does, so to speak. But it's an interesting dynamic that you end up with these sort of clumps of people who know things. I mentioned this in connection with countries because it can tend to be the case that that you know, there's some country with a lot of very capable people, but they just are not connected to that guild, so to speak. And so they never really understand how to do, let's say, computational X for some X. And certainly some things I've tried to do have tried to sort of break down that, that uh, kind of geographical barrier. Um, but I think that's something that is not so easy to do. And uh, it's something, it's one of the challenges here is that a lot of what develops is based on sort of personal contacts, and some of those are very geographically, geographically based. Um, I think that uh, if I look at my own trajectory in science and so on, one of the things I realized just very recently, I'm sort of shocked I didn't realize this before, it's kind of an example of doing history is sometimes harder from the inside than it is from the outside. That is when I study the historical biographies of people, I can kind of see you know, after the fact and from the outside, how to sort of join the dots of why did this happen and then this happen in this person's career, but sometimes a little harder to see that for oneself and it takes real sort of thought to see how that works. But I've noticed a thing, which is that most areas have this kind of guild type character that, you know, oh, the people who work in mathematical logic or in theorem proving or whatever else or some area, they're all kind of a a, a set of people who kind of know each other and learn from each other in an apprentice kind of way. Well, one of the things that, that I've done many times actually is, you know, I'll just read what people have written and go try and do it myself. And I, I hadn't really realized how unusual that actually is because, and when people, when I've kind of worked in particular fields and people are like, oh my gosh, you're an outsider. How come you're doing interesting things in our field? And sometimes they're very positive about that. Sometimes they're very negative about that. Um, but I, I sort of only just realized that that's more unusual than one thinks. That most of the time people within a field have, have got there by some kind of apprenticing process rather than by just reading what people have written, using the tools that exist and just diving right in. Um, and you know, I don't really know what the cause of that dynamic is um, but that's something which I've noticed in terms of sort of the progress of different areas. And that has some effect on the relationship between geography and progress and so on. Uh, let's see. Peter is asking about um, the capabilities of Mathematica and Wolfram Institute. Wolfram Institute is, is really about basic science. And it's about things that uh, are contributing to sort of the, the corpus of ideas in the world and the corpus of, of, of basic things that are figured out. Uh, no doubt some of those things, as has been the case for other basic science that I've done, will be usable to develop technological kinds of things 
and to develop tooling and things in Waltham language and so on. No doubt that will happen. But the big sort of calculation here is let's do things that where the motivation is basic science. You know, in the end, when we're building Waltham language, the motivation is the product, the tool, which is Waltham language. Um, and something that people are going to use, some, something that is a product that, that one sells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the goal there. But for the Institute, the goal is pure basic research that is being put out there into the world for anybody to use without the motivation that it has any sort of short-term uh, commercial or other value, that its value is really an intellectual value and a value, it's sort of a, a gift to the, to the future of the world, so to speak, rather than something where you can say, here's this thing, it's you know, protected by intellectual property law, and we're going to you know, take advantage of it for ourselves, so to speak. Um, so there's a question. Uh, the, um, yeah, by the way, this whole question about um, uh, guilds and geography and so on, it, it is quite interesting. And I, I, it's something that it's a piece of data science, somebody should do it to look at these different fields, you know, take the papers on archive. We now have in Wolfram language, great ways to import the PDFs and all that kind of thing. You can, you can, uh, you know, grind them up and um, see what's there and so on. Um, and ask the question, you know, to what extent can you see kind of the trade routes, the geographical trade routes, so to speak, of different ideas? You know, to what extent is it the case that we really are in a global world when it comes to, for example, science, and to what extent is it still fairly local, or for example, at least local on the student genealogical tree of science, so to speak. Uh, my guess is it's fairly local, um, that ideas sort of don't jump very often from uh, you know just purely through the literature, so to speak, that it tends to be more through personal contact. I don't know, it's a study one could do. Um, So let's see, there's a question here about, um, from uh, Agostino about uh, my opinion about experimental mathematics and its relationship with classical quotes, mainstream mathematics. Okay, so people have done quotes, experimental mathematics for a long time in the sense of sort of figuring out what's true. Often when people say, we're pure mathematicians, we're going to prove everything. They have a certain methodology and it's like your paper is only worth anything if it's got theorems and proofs in it. But the truth is people from Gauss to Riemann to Euler to certainly Ramanujan, many of the things they discovered, they discovered by playing around with specific examples. Ramanujan particularly famously for that, although I think people didn't understand that as clearly then or even now, that Ramanujan came up with all these incredible formulas about you know, all these uh, formulas for e to the uh, pi square root of 100, and, what is it, 137? No, 173, I've forgotten. One of those things is very close to an integer and that allows you to derive series for pi and a lot of things that are just unbelievably ornate formulas that just look utterly bizarre to people. And Ramanujan was a very good calculator and he kind of got an intuition for when something would be absolutely true and then what its consequences would be. But if you asked him to write down, you know, an epsilon delta proof for what he was doing, he, I'm sure he wouldn't have been able to do it. And, you know, when he wrote to G.H. Hardy uh, in Cambridge in 1913 or so, I think, 19, around that time, um, and said, you know, I've got all these bizarre formulas, look at all these bizarre formulas, and Hardy was like, oh my gosh, this person must be a brilliant mathematical, you know, how could he have derived all these theorems? Well, the answer was he was doing experimental mathematics. And when Hardy responded, you know, I've proved some of your, your results, Ramanujan was like, hey, that's cool. You know, now I know they're true. And uh, because, you know, he had an intuition that they were true and he had calculations that suggested they were true. They didn't have a sort of formal, you know, write it down in traditional mathematics proof. 
And, and in fact, he, he had some things wrong. I mean, he thought he had proved things about the prime number theorem, about the density of primes, um, which turned out wasn't in the end true, although the counterexamples were incredibly large, involved incredibly large numbers and things like that. And it wasn't, uh, it was he, he didn't have access to those. Uh, whereas for the theory of partitions, for example, he nailed it. He, he got from sort of what started as a piece of experimental mathematics, he figured out what exactly is going on and, and that was later proved and so on. Now, uh, so, you know, when it comes to figuring out what's true, I've certainly done lots of experimental mathematics. It's a very important methodology. It's a methodology that is kind of often uh, hidden in corners by people who are, uh, you know, because there's this model of mathematics that's 100 and, you know, some 120, 150 years old that says, you know, mathematics is about you describe a theorem, you have certain axioms, you prove the theorem. Now, truth is, people don't go all the way back to the axioms. You know, I remember asking Andrew Wiles shortly after he proved Fermat's last theorem, so do you know what axioms you used? No idea. Doesn't care. Doesn't matter whether it's just piano arithmetic, whether it's set theory, doesn't matter. What the, the purpose of a proof is to explain why the thing is true so other mathematicians will understand it, uh, which is a different thing from the sort of the um, official version of we're going to prove it from pure axioms. That official version is, is becoming a little bit more visible through ideas like proof assistance. Um, my own recent work on sort of the physicalization of metamathematics kind of makes one realize sort of the limitations of that way of thinking about the structure of mathematics, but that's kind of a different story. I think that the thing that is remarkable about experimental mathematics is you can, if you do it well, you can find things you didn't know were true. Often experimental mathematics is just done to sort of, you know, check off some boxes or add an extra decimal place or something more or less to something where you already knew the structure, you already knew the context of what might be true. Good experimental mathematics is about discovering things where you had no idea that something like that was out there. My friend Mitchell Feigenbaum discovered the universality of period doubling in iterated maps by doing a piece of sort of good experimental mathematics. He had a guess that there might be some kind of scaling principle because he knew a little bit about renormalization group and things like that. But he did the experiment. He didn't do the experiment for the sake of finding that scaling law because he didn't know it was there. He just did the experiment and saw what happened and noticed this phenomenon. When I started working on cellular automata, Back in the early 80s, I had no idea what I would find. I had a definite prejudice that what I would find would be simple rules, simple would lead to simple behavior. I think the, the one thing that perhaps uh, uh, I'm, I'm pleased happened there was that I was sort of a careful enough experimentalist and an unprejudiced enough experimentalist that when I discovered that the thing that I thought was true wasn't actually true, I didn't say, oh, that can't possibly be right. Well, I did at first say that, but after a short while, I, I said, look, I can check the experiment is what I thought it was. And by golly, there's a phenomenon I didn't expect. That's what it takes to do sort of good experimental mathematics. It's also something where, you know, now with our computational language and, and Wolfram language and Mathematica and so on, you can really describe what you're doing. And you describe it with a level of, of precision that is exceeds the level of precision that you might use if you were just presenting a proof uh, according to sort of fuzzily, according to maybe kind of axioms. Um, the, you know, if you have a piece of code, a piece of Wolfram language code that, that says, this is what we did and this is what we got, it's a very clear way to communicate. And the whole idea of our computational language is that it's readable by humans as well as by machines. So that's kind of a, a um, uh, and so, so then this idea of, uh, experimental mathematics, it's like physical experiments. Do you do the experiment well, and can you discover things you didn't already know were there? Unfortunately, quite a lot of experimental mathematics does not have the property that it allows one to discover or succeeds in discovering things one didn't already know were there. It's more of a, a box checking exercise. But good experimental mathematics is all about kind of getting out of our kind of local domain of what we already know is true, because one of the things that happens is when you build mathematics sort of step by theorem by theorem, you're, you're doing it in a certain way. As we now understand from this physicalization of mathematics, 
we're making what we call an entailment tone, where you're saying this theorem entails this other theorem entails this other theorem. It's a it's a whole formal structure of kind of analogous to the light cone in physics of what what thing what mathematical result entails what other mathematical results. But when you do experimental mathematics, you jump. It's like you go in a meta mathematical spacecraft and you're just jumping to some completely other area of math meta mathematical space. You're you're not reliant on this kind of structure of go sort of theorem by theorem, step by step axiom of application by axiom application. You're jumping somewhere else. Now, the problem with jumping somewhere else is you may land there and you may look around and you may say, I don't know what the heck is here. It's something totally alien. It's something I completely don't understand. And it's also something where I may have no context for knowing why it's important. You know, one of the things that's very, very odd and a sort of a, a strange consequence of the story of Ramanujan is that Ramanujan was somebody who, you know, was a uh, was a basically a, sh a clerk in, in the port of Madras in, in India. And although he had some uh, uh, pretty decent education, um, but he was he was employed as a human calculator to add up, you know, uh, I don't know, freight charges and taxes and things like this, um, which apparently he did very, very quickly. But, um, uh, you know, he was sort of an amateur mathematician, kind of. I mean, he, he was known in the, in the local area as a, as a sort of a, a notable mathematical person. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, he just in the end wrote these letters to G.H. Hardy, who was a well-known British mathematician, um, uh, which were just like, here's a bunch of formulas, very weird kind of letter. So that tradition of just send a letter with a bunch of formulas has, I don't know whether it pre-existed before Ramanujan, but it certainly existed after Ramanujan. And somebody like me, you know, gets lots of these and they're just sort of tables of formulas or just mathematical results that are like, and so then the question is, do these mean something? Are they, you know, are they correct? Do they mean something? Very, very hard to tell. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, and Ramnujan was fortunate in a sense, or was very talented in being able to see the bigger picture. You know, he got a zillion formulas involving, you know, pies and, and elliptic functions and this and that and the other. And he could sort of see how to make kind of a coherent, even though he didn't really pull those threads together, he didn't explain those threads, but he could at least make a family of formulas that seem to have relations to each other. And, and that's something for which to do that, you have to have sort of a bigger picture understanding of what's going on and just jumping in that metamathematical spacecraft and letting yourself off at this weird place in metamathematical space where you can do a piece of experimental mathematics and discover something and say, here's this weird thing is, is, not, is, is not so productive. I mean, I think one of the big achievements in my effort, my new kind of science book, is that it contextualizes what otherwise might just be sort of point facts. Oh, you take the cellular automaton and you run it and it produces from simple rules, you get very complicated and seemingly random behavior. So what? Well, the so what is that you can build this whole new kind of science around that phenomenon and you know principles like the principle of computational equivalence and so on that kind of knit together those individual discoveries that you make. So I think that's the... Um, uh, that's the story there. Now, now you know, it's, it's worth pointing out that it's become somewhat popular to have these kind of uh, proof assistance and automated theorem proving and so on. Automated theorem proving is not really experimental mathematics, or it has not been used that way, pretty much except by me. Um, and uh, automated theorem proving tends to be a story of, we already know this is true, let's show that the computer can actually fill in the steps of the proof. And usually what you get is something incomprehensible to humans. You know, in, in Wolfram Alpha, for example, when we have our step-by-step -step, uh, results for, for students and so on, we are creating what amounts to a proof. This integral comes out this way, but we're creating a proof that has the setup that it is supposed to be understandable step-by-step -step to, to a human. When an automated theorem proving system says, I can follow the axioms and do this kind of jigsaw puzzle in such a way that I can make a path from, from sort of the, 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 the origin to, to the results I'm trying to get. That path 
will typically be utterly incomprehensible to us humans. We won't have any kind of way of understanding what's going on there. And to my surprise, actually, I realized recently that there's a result that I found using automated theorem proving in the year 2000. I found the simplest axiom system for Boolean algebra, for, for logic, just a single axiom involving six NAND operations and, and three variables. Um, the, uh, and I found that using automated theorem proving. And um, uh, I believe that's the only result that was unexpected that has ever been found with automated theorem proving in all these years. Actually, that was a good example of sort of the guild phenomenon because, because there have been sort of a guild of people working on automated theorem proving. And they were, I think it's fair to say, utterly shocked that somebody would just come in and use what they'd done and discover something. It was kind of like, you know, that's only for the guild kind of thing. It was kind of uh, unpleasant in some ways, but, but um, uh, the, um, the thing that was, um, was interesting was kind of ironic because, because um, back in the early days of computer algebra, um, I had been a big user of systems that people had built before Mathematica, before my SMP system, uh, there were, I've talked about this in, in another one of these live streams, the history of, of computer algebra. Um, there had been back from the 1960s even, there had been a, a whole bunch of sort of experimental and, and, uh, uh, and so on systems that uh, did uh, computer algebra. And, um, but they had tended not to be used outside of their guild. They had tended to be used only with babysitting from their original creators and so on. And I suppose in retrospect, I realized that it was again a sort of surprising thing. I didn't think it was remarkable. I didn't think it was remarkable any time in the last forty years. I've only just now realized it might be slightly more remarkable. That uh, you know, I sort of came in from outside that field and uh, uh, just said, "Look, this is this is good stuff. These are great tools. I can just use these tools." And um, I, you know, sometimes they don't work perfectly, and I have to kind of patch them up and so on. But I know enough to be able to do that. Um, and you can just sort of dive in and start using the tools. And that's, that's a, a thing that um, uh, for automated theorem proving hadn't happened. I mean, we're, we're trying to make it automated theorem proving a little bit more mainstream through its use of morphem language and so on. And uh, uh, we sort of implicitly use it quite a lot. Uh, maybe this work on mathematics I've done recently might help again to sort of mainstream that a little bit. Automated theorem proving sort of in a sense isn't what you might think it is in the sense it's not giving you a human explanation of what's going on, nor is it discovering things you didn't know before or hasn't traditionally been used that way. Um, it is instead more a validation process for something that you kind of already knew was true. That's the traditional way it's been used. It's not the only way it could be used. And so, for example, if we look at automated theorem proving today, well, the sort of the branch of it that is proof assistance, okay, in automated theorem proving, it's like, here are some axioms, Here's a theorem, go figure out if it's true and generate the proof. Uh, in proof assistance, it's more like here you build up a set of human understandable mathematical statements and you kind of, you as a human, try and fill in the jigsaw puzzle and the proof assistant will tell you, yes, that piece fits in the jigsaw puzzle in that way, or no, you've got to try a different piece. And sort of a combination of those two things of proof assistant and actual computational system like Wolfram well, Language or Mathematica or automated theorem proving, but I think more so or from language, that's something that's potentially powerful, although I have to say I haven't really figured out exactly how those should connect. The workflow is very different. Uh, one workflow in you know, using Wolfram language, you're trying to work out things you didn't already know were true uh, or didn't already know what the result is, whereas in a proof assistant, you're more trying to fill in the details of something you're pretty sure is true. And I think the thing that's particularly important is in Wolfram language, we put a lot of effort into defining how to describe things, sort of making a description language for concepts. And that's something which in the end is critically important if you want to actually make sort of large scale proof assistant kinds of things work. I mean, right now, I think that sort of validating protocols and things like that is the most likely kind of direction for sort of uh, near term success of things like proof assistance, more so than pure mathematics. and. I've understood that now more through this project on the physicalization of, of metamathematics, this notion that what mathematicians do is more sort of operating at the level of sort of the fluid dynamics of mathematics, the, the big large scale flows of what's connected to what, 
rather than the molecular dynamics of the details of individual sort of axiomatic steps. And that that's more the picture of mathematics that, that emerges for practical pure mathematicians, not this sort of low level machine code kind of approach. And that even with a low level machine code, you can't necessarily uh, decompile it to the point where you have a larger scale picture. I mean, that's exactly what happens in automated theorem proving, like the proof of my um, uh, axiom system for Boolean algebra is incomprehensible to humans. Actually, there was a person named Norm McGill who was uh, just in the last, oh, in the fall of last year, finally took it upon himself to decode that, um, uh, uh, that proof and try and simplify it to the point where it was understandable to humans. And unfortunately, he died last December, so that, that initiative uh, uh, stopped. But um, uh, the, um, I, I hope that, you know, it's sort of an interesting thing that 20 years have passed, 22 years have passed, and that proof is still as incomprehensible as it ever was. And I think that's, um, uh, it's, it's no good to say, well, I've got this formal proof, it's magnificent. Nobody will ever understand it. That's not the mechanism of mathematical progress that people have been used to in, in doing practical pure mathematics. So um, let's see. The, um, the question, I mean, yeah, I, you know, just to, just to finish on this point about experimental mathematics, I mean, I think there is a good way to do experimental mathematics, and it is very much like the good ways to do physical experiments. You've got to be careful. You've got to be clear and clean describe what you're doing well. You've got to have good pieces of computational language code. You've got to have good visualization that lets one sort of plug into our human ability to perceive things. You know, if you've just got a table of numbers, you're very unlikely to be able to notice the things you want to notice just because our human perception system is not as well tuned in that case. We have, you know, lots of fibers going from our, uh, you know, down our optic nerve that, communicate a lot of data from, from complete visual forms, so to speak. Um, I, I would like to compare a little bit the field of ruleology that we started talking about recently with experimental mathematics. Uh, so ruleology is kind of a field derived from this whole new kind of science approach from exploring the computational universe. Ruleology is about you write down computational rules, simple, elegant, essential computational rules and then you see what consequences they have. Uh, how does that relate to experimental mathematics? Well, it could be a branch of that, but mathematics tends to involve certain structures that have been traditional in mathematics, things like numbers, things like uh, geometry and so on. Whereas ruleology is in a sense, a lower level science. It's a science where the primitives are pure arbitrary computational primitives, a rewriting of a string, a structure that is being transformed in this or that way, more so than having building on top of sort of existing known mathematical structures. And experimental mathematics is, a, in a sense, one can think of it as, uh, and perhaps it will emerge this way, as a branch of ruleology. Ruleology is the more general field that is sort of given a simple rule, what will it do? The particular case of rules that have sort of a mathematical resonance becomes more experimental mathematics. But again, one feature of ruleology is it's deeply enmeshed with computational irreducibility. And much ruleology will be necessarily, you've kind of gone out in a ruleal spacecraft and you're off you know, in a different place in ruleal space exploring these rules and what they do and how that relates to kind of what we normally think about and are interested in is, is something non-trivial to figure out. And this whole sort of all these results from multi-computation, which show that certain kinds of uh, places in, in ruleal space, certain kinds of things generically happen, that's important in making more coherence in that kind of field. But ruleology in and of itself is already a very important field. Just like, for example, chemistry is already a very important field, even though you might not be able to join the dots to know, oh, this kind of bromine thing does that to that and so on. It, it may be uh, that you are just discovering this particular chemical reaction is useful or has this particular property. And that's useful because one day that 
that that piece of essential basic science will be taken off the shelf and somebody will say, by golly, we can use that to fuel a new generation of rockets or something. Okay, I should probably uh, wrap up soon. Um, uh, let's see, oh my. You guys are asking lots of interesting questions here. Um, Let me maybe uh, take this one more here from Parker. It says, I often hear that science needs philosophy to justify it. What are some historical examples of this? You know, the relationship between philosophy and science is kind of interesting. If you're a practicing scientist, you kind of, you don't really think much about philosophy. Let me give you an analogy, strange analogy. In Wolfram Language in Mathematica, do all kinds of computations involving all kinds of numbers. But you rarely have to think about the units for those numbers. Because by the time you're industrially doing a computation involving a million numbers, the fact that they're all in meters or all in inches, that's already factored out. You've already, you've done that. You, you've taken care of that. And now you're in the, in the big industrial part where you're studying things. So it is with science and philosophy in the sense that there might be some philosophy that explains why you should do this, but by the time you're dug in to actually doing the details of the science, that sort of seems irrelevant. Now, what's interesting in, so, so for example, in my life, uh, I would say that I've used little philosophy in motivating, I had used little philosophy in motivating in, in sort of the science I did um, my mother happened to be a philosophy professor. And so I, when I was a kid, kind of took the point of view, oh my gosh, you know, people are still arguing about the same stuff they've argued about for 2000 years. This field is doomed. I'm never gonna do anything to do with philosophy. But what I've discovered in my later life, so to speak, is that when you get foundational enough in science, you run into philosophy. You run out of the sort of industrial machine that can be built in science and you're really dealing with the foundations, and then you have to think about philosophy because you have to think about how does this, what is the ultimate foundation of what's going on here? And that's not something which is going to come back from this kind of structure that's been built, the big sort of superstructure that's been built in science. So for example, in, uh, uh, in a lot of things I've done recently about um, understanding how we understand why there are physical laws, how can, we pick out the particular laws for our universe from the set of all possible laws and from this whole rouliad of a sort of entangled computations and the realization that it all is to do with us as kind of observers of the system and the nature of our consciousness and how it relates to what's going on in these systems. And in, in what I've done in metamathematics recently, um, I realized that this whole philosophical question of is mathematics a real thing are there sort of ideal forms in the sense of Plato? That's something that actually has immediate consequences for one's real approach to doing sort of metamathematics and mathematics. But I think that historically, the, the role of philosophy as a driver of science has been rather poor. I mean, I think that um, if one looks at, uh, and, and you know, there were many kind of um, uh, sort of, uh, things that happened there. I mean, for example, you know, famously in the time of Galileo, early 1600s, um, uh, there was sort of the big question uh, of, you know, should we, should we, in a sense, trust what we can think about by common sense? The kinds of things that had arisen, they had been sort of uh, put into concrete form in, you know, biblical texts and so on, and, and then built on conceptually in theology but in the end, it was about what can we just figure out by pure philosophical thought versus what does science have to parachute in and show us? And that had been the big thing with Copernicus of, you know, one could by, by apparently pure thought deduce that, you know, the earth is standing still, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then sort of the science parachuted in and said, well, actually, that's not true. So this, this kind of transition from that which you could figure out by pure thought. You know, Aristotle, in his views of science, it's mostly kind of common sense plus logical deduction. 
was kind of the approach here. Um, and uh, uh, so when that got sort of broken by this idea of, oh, there's this whole pile of formal science that you can build that makes use of mathematics and, and this and that, um, the, um, that's, um, that was a place which kind of squashed out this kind of, it's common sense plus philosophical in the sense of sort of pure rational reasoning about what's going on. And I think that if one tries to look through sort of the history of, um, of developments in science, um, I would suspect that the, in the end, serious developments in science require essentially a philosophical component, but often that is barely even described by the creators of those developments. I think that um, if we look at, I don't know, uh, Turing and the universal computer, uh, that was not a very philosophically driven thing. It was a very practical, I'm solving a math problem. This is a mechanism for doing that. Now, if you look at um, Gödel, for example, and Gödel's theorem, Gödel actually did have a philosophical uh, motivation. Uh, he wanted to show that Plato's idea that there's a real thing in mathematics and these axioms that people like Hilbert had, had sort of set up as ways to describe an abstract mathematics that, as Hilbert said, could be about tables and chairs as much as it could be about points and lines. Uh, Gödel said that's not true. There's really an intrinsic there there for mathematics. And he did Gödel's theorem to prove that this for sort of formalistic approach wasn't going to work and that there really is a there there for, for mathematics. I think our recent efforts in the physicalization of metamathematics finally sort of vindicate Gödel and, and Plato and show that there really is a there there in, in the foundations of mathematics in a way that isn't captured by the sort of axiomatic approach. But that was a, a sort of philosophically motivated thing, although most people don't really even know that. I didn't even know that until recently uh, about Gödel's motivation in doing that. And, you know, in my own life, there are certainly things which are, I would say, almost philosophical. Things like, um, I would, I would say that philosophy has entered in my own life more implicitly than explicitly until recently. This idea, uh, you know, in, in early times, ideas about um, computational irreducibility and sort of using computation as models of the world and what it means to model the world and so on. Implicitly, there's lots of philosophy there. But the way that I thought about it was not in philosophical terms. A little bit more directly, when after new kind of science and the development of the principle of computational equivalence and so on, I was thinking about building what would become Wolfram Alpha, something which I had thought about for decades earlier, but had believed that the only way to get to Wolfram Alpha was by making sort of a, a general AI. Um, and then I realized that if I believed the principle of computational equivalence at an almost philosophical level, it implied that there was no bright line between the intelligent and the merely computational. So given that we had lots of computational tools, well, let's just go and try and build Wolfram Alpha. And, and that was successful. So that was a sort of philosophically motivated development. Now, I would say that um, uh, in, you know, it's an interesting thing to survey different, different advances in science and which ones kind of were kind of philosophy first. I would say that for me, I tend to build the science. And then as I try to really understand why does it work that way, then one dives into philosophy. So for example, understanding why the laws of physics and the fundamental laws of mathematics that we seem to be deducing, um, why that works that way and why that's sort of in the eye of the beholder and involves us as human observers, that becomes pretty deeply philosophical. Um, I think that one could say something like understanding that space is made of stuff, that that's a philosophical kind of question. You know, I wrote a piece recently called On the Concept of Motion. One could have said, at least back a couple of thousand years, that's a philosophical idea. Why can things move? In modern times, that would, philosophy would have been thrown out of that discussion. It's now sort of back um, because we're thinking about things at a more foundational level. And um, so I, I think um, uh, uh, the question of, of sort of the interaction between science and philosophy, there's sort of the frameworks for thinking about science. Um, there's, uh, and then there's the sort of, uh, in a sense, a lot of the important 
uh, directions in science are defined by sort of strategies for science. Does the philosophy give one a sort of a, a path, a, strat a strategic path? For me, it has a few times. I would say in general, that is not a common thing. The uh, sort of uh, understanding, I mean, th there are areas of science like neuroscience, for example, where some people kind of use philosophy as a guiding uh, strategy for some of the things that they think about. Um, I'm not sure quite how successful that is. And I think perhaps many people say it's, it's much safer to be a, um, um, uh, um, a kind of, uh, we're just dissecting pieces of brains and deducing things from it than to make these kind of philosophical statements. You know, I was giving advice to a person who's been working with us who, who does a mixture of uh, mathematics and physics and, and philosophy, and he's trying to decide, should he, should he get a job in a, um, in a physics department or in a philosophy department? And so I made the point, if you're in a physics department, the physicists will look down on the philosophy you do. If you're in a philosophy department, the philosophers will look up to the physics that you do. So you're probably better off in a philosophy department. And it's been interesting because of the work I've been doing recently in mathematics, I've had a bit more uh, visibility into sort of the modern philosophy departments. And I would say that the, um, uh, in, there's, there's much more sort of uh, content knowledge, I would say, of particular areas that now seems to exist there. I will make one comment, which is that I've, I've talked quite a bit about um, some of the things we've done in our physics project, for example, in different audiences, different groups of people. And I, I've been, uh, and maybe it's a selection effect, I've been rather impressed generally at the philosophers relative to the scientists in modern times, because the scientists don't expect to actually have to think about anything big. They expect that if you're telling them about something, it's like, well, we've got an incremental piece of progress because that's the way science has mostly progressed. And so if you say, this is a big idea, they're like, we don't know how to think about big ideas. We know how to think about specific developments. Whereas the philosophers are kind of much more, it's all big ideas. They've been churning ever since antiquity and it's big ideas all the way, so to speak. Not always, but that's, that seems to be one, one dynamic. And so that means when you talk about big ideas, uh, they're kind of much more uh, attuned to listening for how to think about big ideas than typical modern scientists are. I think there are other aspects of sort of the interaction between philosophy and science, uh, some of the kinds of things about, um, uh, you know, in, in a sense, there's philosophy where you can discuss it. You can discuss is space relative or absolute. You can discuss is free will versus determinism and so on. But in the end, you can make precise scientific theories about these things. And that's sort of an interesting moment when the philosophy segues into precise science. And I've seen a bunch of that happen in some of the projects we've been doing, uh, I've been doing over the last few decades. Um, it's also another thing that happens is sometime the philosophy, if, it, if you're dealing with ethics or something like this, sometime the, uh, you know, in the end, the thing that has been debated in ethics forever and ever has to turn into a piece of code that decides where to turn the steering wheel of the self-driving car. So do they have steering wheels? Well, yes, they do still. But um, uh, actually, I just saw one example, one that doesn't. So, so uh, that, that'll be an anachronism soon enough. But in any case, the, the, the point is what, what starts as a philosophical discussion about trolley problems and things like that. In the end, it's a piece of code. And, and that's sort of an interesting process that's happening right now. Same thing with political philosophy. Um, in a sense, you know, there are, there are questions there about, you know, as the AI runs the central bank, as the AI decides things about, you know, propaganda versus uh, communication and so on, uh, you know, what does that, uh, you know, what, what was a piece of political philosophy will turn into a piece of code. And, and that's a, an interesting thing that's happening in, in, in the present time. And actually a reason why sort of uh, the more people get educated about sort of philosophical ideas, uh, you know, many of these ideas, it, it's kind of funny, you know, you, you see these discussions about things about so oh, this or that sort of political philosophy kind of question. And, and you realize, boy, you know, that was already people were talking about that 2000 years ago, there's been a lot figured out about that, you know, it may be one may not know what the answer is. But it certainly is the case that if you take some point of view that comes in trained with lots of other consequences of that point of view, and that's had a couple of thousand years to be worked out. But when people come, it's kind of like the question of, do you know history? 
uh, you know, in, okay, in science, it tends to be the case <clears throat> that the latest is best. We've got to a certain stage in some area of science and the surface is what you need to know about typically, roughly. Um, in, in something like history, well, you could say we don't care about the past. We, we learn nothing from it. We don't need to learn, you know, back, back the, you know, the history of the ancients and so on. Um, but actually it does seem like there's a lot one can learn from history. And I think philosophy is a little bit the same kind of way. There are questions that have been discussed for thousands of years, and they're the same questions that we're discussing today. And it isn't the case that you just say, what's the latest? Let me refer only to the paper that was published in the 2010s. You know, anything before that, oh, no, 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 that can't be relevant. That might be the right thing for some area of biomedicine. It's not the right thing for these fundamental questions and things like philosophy. Um, comment here from um, Uh, Warman, I think in a lot of places in history, the role of academic pursuit was that of a philosopher, but academic pursuit has attained a large amount of division of labor. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is to some extent true that, that academia was, you know, academia in the 1200s was often training for the church and theology and so on. And theology was sort of a principal place where thinking and serious intellectual pursuits were concentrated. And I think that the as sort of practicalizable things like science became more prominent, you know, the role of universities has been much more let's let's deliver the practical results, skills, et cetera, um, than this thing about let's, I mean, this is a, a long discussion, not for today, about sort of the role of universities and their relationship between sort of the transmission of knowledge across centuries versus the development of new knowledge versus kind of the, the promotion of the, of the new, so to speak. And these are all different roles that one can kind of discuss and debate, you know, what the right place for those things is. For example, returning to the Wolfram Institute and our efforts there, in a sense, what we're, what we're doing there is something which is sort of a, a, a new approach to getting innovative basic science done. It's a different approach than the sort of the university approach. The university approach has sort of evolved in that direction over the course of, well, particularly the last 50 or so years, but the last 100, 150 years. Uh, and this is sort of a, a somewhat different approach that is more informed by the success of corporate R&D than it is by what's, been, what's happened at universities. Um, Uh, yeah, a comment from Parmenides about um, philosophy and mathematical logic and their overlap. Um, yeah, that's a that's an interesting topic, maybe for another time. Uh, I mean, I think that the um, uh, you know part of that overlap, I think, was driven by a strange phenomenon, which is that logic was ejected from mathematics. Uh, the the study of it used to be the case in I don't know, the Middle Ages or something. People would study mathematics, they would study logic, they were kind of neck and neck both worth studying logic more for, for, the, for rhetoric, for structuring arguments, mathematics for calculating things and so on. You know, mathematics built this giant, you know, tower structure and became hugely relevant for the everyday world and people's practical lives. And that became sort of a, a big thing, whereas logic kind of withered away as this obscure thing that nobody really sort of seemed to care about. Um, and, uh, that meant that there was kind of a, a human dynamic, that there were mathematics departments. And it's like logicians, logicians, should they be in the mathematics department? No, you know, they should be well in the philosophy department. Because after all, logic was invented by Aristotle and Aristotle was a philosopher. So send them to the philosophy department. So that caused a bunch of logic and the more advanced forms of logic turned into mathematical logic and so on. It, it caused little, little uh, sort of, uh, the little sort of colonizations of philosophy departments by what amounted, what became mathematical logic. And I think that's part of the reason why there's a little bit more crosstalk between philosophy and there are, you know, because the logicians were ejected from mathematics and sent to the philosophy department, that's, that's caused there to be a little bit more sort of philosophical uh, dressing around mathematical logic. Um, 
Oh, you guys are asking too many interesting questions. Um, Adam is asking, are there inherently philosophical ideas that cannot be turned into scientific ones? Can we distinguish them outright without knowing future scientific developments? I think no. I think any question that is asked that is kind of a, a, like, why does the universe exist? A philosophical question, you might think, except for the fact that last year I realized there's actual science you can say about that. Actually, that question was so philosophical that it hadn't really been touched much even by the philosophers. But I think a lot of these questions about kind of, um, uh, I, think, I think in the end, we can start to fill in with science what was outlined by philosophy in almost every area. I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of ones where, where one can't. And I've, I've just seen an awful lot of examples where one has been able to. I think that um, uh, even, well, these areas where, where philosophy um, intersects with things like theology, um, I've been surprised, like a question like, why does the universe exist, is something that has a whole theological dimension where it's not about, you know, what was written in this or that sacred book. It's about kind of the type of thinking that goes on when you think globally about the nature of the universe and so on, which is something which has been the purview of, of theology more so than, certainly more so than science over the course of time. So I, I think it, it's, um, I, I, I must say that it might almost be a formula for, for seeing future science to say, what is the discussion in philosophy that has not yet been scienceized? Now, when I say scienceized, I'm a little bit you know, afraid of using that term because to many people, science means the paradigm that arose in the 1600s where everything is turned into a number more or less. But that's not the only story of science. These paradigms of science that have come up the computational paradigm from the 1980s, the multi-computational paradigm from now, those are different ways to make formal something that might otherwise be just thought of as philosophy, to make, make it into something that you can actually do things with, compute with, build on, incrementally uh, make progress in. And I think that's a, that in a sense is, is my kind of definition of what it means to do science, is something where there's a formal structure that allows incremental progress not necessarily a turn everything into numbers, write down formulas, be able to work out the answer. It's that there is a formal structure that allows you to make progress. So I think that um, when I say there are questions about, oh, I don't know, the philosophy of, around human nature, political philosophy, these kinds of things, it isn't the case that I expect when I say to scienceize them, I don't expect that that means somebody's going to be able to say, and that means that the rate, you know, the interest rate from the central bank is going to be X because that leads to this income distribution and that's proved to be right by science. That's not going to happen. That's, it's still a, it's a different, it'll be different kinds of scientific questions, different things you can say that have a formal structure that aren't the things that were sort of the numbers version of science that came from the 1600s. You know, I was struck recently in terms of those kinds of questions by a piece of history I didn't know about Francis Bacon, um, who was kind of a, a um, uh, sort of a, an originator of the modern scientific method story. Um, and he was also a courtier in England uh, with Elizabeth I, I guess, if I'm getting my dates correct. Um, the, and, um, you know, one of the things that he realized was, if you can prove it by science, the public should believe you. And so he kind of developed this idea of let's have this notion of the scientific method and the prove it by science kind of approach, because then we don't have to just argue with rhetoric, you know, believe us, we're, we're you know, we're, we're sort of telling you the right thing rhetorically. Instead, one can just say, look, you can just do science and that's the answer. And that's the ultimate absolute truth, so to speak. I think that... Um, um, I, I'm a little bit horrified by the fact that that story has arguably been overplayed in the story of the pandemic and this and that and the other of, you know, we've derived it from science. So boom, we know the absolute truth. Um, in fact, you know, often things are much less certain than one might assume from that. And that's partly a consequence of computational irreducibility. It's partly the nature of science and what's knowable and kind of a whole sort of philosophical chain there. But it, but it is interesting to see the, uh, you know, the extent to which I think the questions of philosophy um, end up being things which ultimately, I think, 
will mostly end up being formalizable in some way that goes beyond the merely rhetorical. And that will be the moment at which they start to turn into things that we can think of as being related to science. All right, we should wrap up there. Thanks for lots of interesting questions and comments. And uh, I see there are more saved up for another time. But let's wrap up here for now. And thanks for joining me. And 